and welcome to the first session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 9. We're thrilled to be back with you for another exciting AE Live series. My name is Lauren and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Amanda, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, our host Kate will be talking with our presenter, Kim Carroll, about grouping strategy categories and several fun creative techniques for establishing effective groups. So let's get started. Hello everyone. As Lauren said, my name is Kate and I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. We're so excited to begin another great American English Live series and we look forward to learning with you through November during this series. So thanks so much for joining us. Let's begin today with these great comments from participants from our last webinar. Our first uh, participant here says, thank you so much. I learned so much from Julie M. Thanks, Julie, for that great comment. And Rebecca says, great session, great learning experience and worth sharing with colleagues. Thanks so much. And finally, Robastiana says, wonderful tips and ideas for activities, very adaptable. We're so happy to hear all of those great comments from our participants and we encourage you to share your comments and questions and ideas as well. You can also email us with any ideas or thoughts at American English webinars at FHI 360 or share any ideas you have on social media. And we hope to um, feature one of your quotes in the next webinar. So today is the first session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 9. This series will explore sessions related to the themes of collaborative learning in the English language classroom, cultivating meaningful discussion using critical thinking skills, and corrective feedback in the classroom. We hope you'll be able to use the practical ideas we share. Which session or theme are you most excited about? Let us know in the chat box. So here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an online professional English network, OPEN, online course. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or the chat box. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully done so, you can expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. And we're thrilled to share about our current self-paced massive open online course or MOOC, TESOL Methodology. The course opened on September 8th and will remain open until November 30th. We hope you'll join us for this free MOOC focused on effective TESOL practices for the 21st century. Course participants will learn how to create an effective and communicative language classroom for all learners. To learn more and enroll, visit the link both on the screen and being shared by the moderators in the chat or comments. And now for today's session, random or intentional, putting students in groups that work. In this webinar, we will explore the art of grouping learners in ways that will build a sense of community, encourage communication, and support classroom management. We'll also discuss different ways to group students, explore the benefits of a selection of grouping strategies, and, making grouping and, and also discuss making grouping decisions based on real classroom activities for both online and face-to-face -face instruction. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Kim Carroll. Kim is the owner and director of English for Life Academy in South Carolina, which offers TESOL certificates, intercultural coaching, and customized English courses for organizations. She recently served as a U.S. Department of State English Language Fellow in Paraguay from 2019 to 2020. And Kim has worked in the U.S., Paraguay, Canada, Nicaragua, Mexico, Ecuador, and South Korea. She has a BA in Environmental Studies and Anthropology and a Master's of Education in Divergent Learning for Adult Language Learners. She's a certified professional coach and intercultural trainer. She also holds a certificate in English teacher education and an advanced TEFL certificate. Welcome, Kim. We're so happy to have you here with us today. 
Thank you, Kate. I'm really excited to be able to work with you all and share with so many teachers from around the globe. Our topic for today is random or intentional, how to put learners into groups that work. And to get started, I would like to hear a little bit about your classroom and how you deal right now with working with, with learners and the groups that you put them in. So let's start off with a quiz. This is true or false. For you, what's, what's true for you? When I put learners into groups, it's usually based on where they are sitting or online how they are grouped, how they are randomly grouped. All right, so are you, do you usually put learners into random groups, like how they're sitting or just sort of how they're listed maybe um, in an online setting? What do you think, true or false? We'd love to see your ideas here. Let's see, Talsif says, I do random and intentional, great. Rizwan says true. Let's see, false, true. We have probably about 50-50. Looks like a lot of people are saying both. Let's see, Mary says, hello from La Paz, hello. Randomly group from JM. And Argelia says, true. So lots of different answers. Thank you so much for sharing everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. The next question in your quiz is, I don't usually have students work in small groups because it hasn't worked well for me in the past. Yeah, what do you think everybody? Is that true or false for you? I don't usually have students work in small groups because it hasn't worked well for me in the past. So maybe it hasn't worked and so you just decided, no, never mind. Camila says, no, that's not true. Um, Omorowski says, false. I asked them to stand up so that they end up with different classmates. That's a nice idea. Um, let's see. And it sounds like Tausif sometimes uses groups. He says, it depends on the situation. That's great. All right, thanks everybody. Sounds good. Let's go to our final question for now. While grouping students, I think about the intention of the activity and I group learners accordingly. All right, what do you think everybody? Do you usually group students intentionally? So true or false, while grouping students, I think about the intention of the activity and group learners accordingly. So Camila says yes, for sure. Awesome, thank you for that response. Let's see, um, we have a few people who say, I love having small groups. Kareem also says yes. Ali says students work better in small groups. And Amik Amikar says, yes, this is the best option to use intention when you're grouping students. So great, thanks for sharing everybody. Thank you for letting us get to know you a little bit. And let's talk real quick about what we're going to cover in today's session. So we have a couple of things on our agenda today. We're going to discuss some of the benefits of group and pair learning first. Next, we will explore how to make group work more effective with intentional grouping. Then we're going to examine three different categories for grouping, random, likability groups and crossability groups. And we're gonna look at when and why and how we might use these different kinds of groups. And then finally, we'll look at some real life classroom scenarios. And I wanna hear what you think about what you would do in these cases. So let's go ahead and get started. To begin, I wanna talk about what intentional grouping actually means. So for me, when I'm thinking about putting my students into groups, I'm considering two different aspects. One is the activity that I want them to do. What are the intentions? What are the goals? And what are the objectives for that activity? Then I want to also think about what the optimal working group size is for that. Is this an activity that's going to work best with partners, something where they just need to talk with one other person? Or is this an activity that's going to work better when we have a group of three, four, or maybe even five people working together. After I think about the activity, I think about my students. What are their proficiency levels? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And I could be talking about language, but also maybe about content area and other, other things as well. 
And I also might consider other factors when I'm thinking about putting them in groups, things like their personality and dispositions, maybe their interests, or possibly their background information about the subject that we're talking about. And I find when you put these two things together, you have a really good chance at successful intentional grouping. So now that we have thought a little bit about what that actually means, let's move on and look at how we want to group students. For me, there are three key components to why I like working with student groups, small groups. First, it really helps to build community in your classroom. It gives students a chance to get to know each other without the teacher necessarily being the moderator. And what is our classroom if it's not just a small microcosm of a community? Second, it really helps us to encourage communication among our students. And as language teachers, that's what we want, right? We want our students to communicate not only with us, but with each other. So small groups and pairs is a great way to encourage and foster good communication among the students. Finally, it can help you to support your classroom management strategies. When you group intentionally, and not just because, you can really help to hone your classroom management skills by how you put the groups together. So we're gonna look at these things as we go throughout our session today. But first I have a question for you. What are some benefits of using pair and group work in your English language classroom? Yeah, what do you think everybody? What are some benefits of using pair and group work in the English language classroom? And while we're waiting for your great comments to come in, I had a nice comment from uh, Michelle Adib, who says it's important to consider students' skills so you can group them equally instead of having just weak students in a group or only strong students in another group. And I think that's a great point. We're going to be talking a lot about all different types of grouping strategies so that you don't always group in the same way. Awesome. So Kareem says students engage when they're in groups. They practice their English and share ideas. Um, Micah says it allows students to speak a lot more when you're in groups. Um, Matsudera says the students will have more chances to practice English. Edison says they learn soft skills like negotiation. Mm. And Junie, uh, Jenny says they support each other. So those are all wonderful responses. Keep them coming, everyone. Thank you. I love hearing all of those responses and I agree with all of them. And I would like to add a few more, more on the language development side of things. So um, we use pair and group work for great language learning. And on the next slide, we'll take a look at a couple of reasons. So first, working in small groups and pairs gives students a chance to practice language functions through authentic interaction and focus on fluency and communication. In this photo here, you see my adult English learners working on a listening activity. They are putting together song lyrics. So I printed the song lyrics to a song, I cut them into strips, and now they have to listen and put them in the correct order. But because they are working in groups, I also noticed a lot of other language that they had to use. They were having to use language functions like agreeing, disagreeing with each other, giving suggestions, receiving feedback, asking for clarification. And all of this was happening around the activity because they were working in groups. So giving them a, a chance to practice language functions is another reason. Second, there's a lot of practice in negotiating meaning when students have to work in groups. In this group project, my teenage students had to create their own superhero and they had to work together to create the character, even the outfits, you can see some pretty amazing drawing there. And what's the superpower, what's the weakness? And they had to write the backstory of the superhero. So how did they find out they were super and all of the things associated. In order to do that, there was a lot of language they didn't know. And so they had to work together to be understood about new vocabulary and things they wanted to say. So I got to hear a lot of negotiation of meaning while they were working on their superheroes. Number three that I wanna share with you is when we have our students work in pairs or small groups, 
It gives them a diversity of partners and contexts and tasks and gives them a chance to practice with cooperative and collaborative skills. Somebody earlier said it gives them a chance to practice with soft skills and this is all part of it, right? Learning how to deal with other people who may be similar or not or different from you and all of that can happen when we have them working together in groups. This picture you see here is a very competitive game of find someone who where they have to talk to as many people in the class as possible to fill up their sheet. So little co uh, competition with the cooperation sometimes helps too. All right, so moving on, I want us to think about how to do this effectively. We've just discussed why putting people into small groups in Paris can work. Now let's talk about how to do it a little bit more effectively. So taking a look at the next slide, we can see that, at least I think, it's possible, it's not impossible. Can we make group work more effective by thinking about how we group learners together? Yes. And today we're gonna to talk about three different ways that we group learners. On the next slide, you'll see the three of them listed out. You can have random groups. You might put people in like ability groups, or you might have them working in mixed ability groups. And today we are going to talk about those different kinds of groups, how, why, and all of the things about when you would use them. But first, I have a question for you. Think about the grouping strategies you use in your classroom. How could you use grouping strategies to enhance student learning? What do you think everybody when you're using groups in your classroom how could you use or how do you use grouping strategies to enhance student learning what do you think everybody we'd love to hear from you let's see oh and manana says that they're they're creating a superhero for their students or their students are doing that for homework so that's a great great comment nice idea thank you let's see here Mixed ability. Kareem says they prefer mixed ability. Great. Mm -hmm. Students will be involved in activities when groups are small. That's great. Tausif says they do it by colors, cards, and fruit names. Mm -hmm. Rosara says that she likes like ability grouping. And Graciela says that they like to encourage students to team up and support each other, which is also nice. And Shintakim says that they um, put different levels into one group. So lots of different ways. And thanks for sharing those great ideas, everybody. I love Graciela's comment about having students support each other because that's one way we can enhance student learning, right? Great, so let's start looking at our first kind of grouping, which is random. Random grouping means that students are completing tasks in randomly selected groups or pairs. I am the teacher, am not choosing who gets to work with who. And I would say also they are not necessarily choosing because then it's not random, they're just picking their best friend. <laughs> so um, random is we are not selecting who gets to work with who intentionally. Um, let me ask a question to you. Are you familiar with random grouping? And could you give us some examples? Yeah, what ways do you randomly group students? Can you give us any examples about of that? Different ways that you put students into groups that are, are sort of random ways. Let's take a look. Let's see, some people use counting off, great. You have them line up by birth date or birth month. That's a great idea. Use numbers from one to three or four and that's how they're divided. Great thinking. Using numbers or colors. Oh, using Dojo to group students from Jessica. Great, I haven't used that strategy before. And maybe just on the color of their shirt from Shaq. Great, wonderful ideas, everybody. Thank you for sharing those ideas, I love them. Let's take a look at um, when we would want to use random grouping strategies. So let's take a look at 
in this picture, you can see that it's a find someone who activity. So one time random grouping strategies tend to work really well is during mixer activities, something where students have to talk with a bunch of different people in their class. They're usually short interactions, something like a find someone who maybe a conversation grid where they have to ask a few questions and move on or even something like an inside outside circle where they have to change partners a lot. It also can work well for short interactions like turn and talk when you're having them practice really quickly something that you were talking about in class or maybe a think pair share where they have to think on their own talk with a partner or group and then share with the class. These are times when random grouping usually works pretty well. Why, though, do we want to use random groups? So usually when I'm putting students into random groups, it's because I want to mix the whole class and I want to help with that community building, breaking the ice and letting them have a chance to get to know each other. I like to use it at times where students can perform at their own ability. So even if you have mixed ability classes, everyone is at their own ability doing their best and it works very well uh, with the kind of activity. Finally, I like to use this for rapidly changing partners activities. So activities like this can build energy in your class, can give an opportunity for repetition uh, if they're having to repeat with every new person they talk to. And sometimes, like we said, we can make it a little bit of a competition and well as well so that helps with the energy these are three reasons that the random grouping strategy can work so next slide we're going to look at how and you already gave us some great ideas on how you might put students into groups so a couple of ways that i like to use are matching pieces so students have to find matches to create their group my first picture there is of jelly beans which is a sugary candy of different colors so if each student chooses one and then they have to get into the group of all the people with their same color uh, the second one you see a deck of playing cards but it doesn't have to be playing cards it could be any flashcards that you make that have numbers or colors or letters or even pictures and they have to get with their matching group the third one you see a jigsaw, but I don't usually use a jigsaw. I like to use a picture from a magazine or a postcard and I will cut it into three or four parts and then distribute the parts and they have to find the other people in the group to create their whole picture. Those are activities that can also have some communication just in the getting into the group process. The second way is counting off, and a couple of you mentioned this already, so you may have them count by numbers or letters. You may have the Monday group and the Tuesday group or anything that is sequential is something you can use to count your students off. So maybe uh, get creative and think about how you could have them count off. The third way I have here is a lineup where you have them line up in order of their birthday or their height and then work with the person next to them or fold the line and work with the person across from them. So I have a question for you. What is what techniques do you use to put students in random groups? Great. So yeah, we had those are some really great ideas. And I see a lot of people saying they like those like Zanab says nice. Sophia says excuse me those are great let's see <coughs> excuse me um Hitet says that they like to use alphabet so maybe the same thing where they line up in alphabetical order jenny also says nice ideas what other techniques do you use participants to put students into random groups um omorowski also says they create a line alphabetically according to their first names Kareem says, according to their date of births, dates of birth, I should say. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for all those great ideas, everyone. Keep them coming. Great. Thank you for those. We're going to move into talking about likability groups, but keep those matching techniques in mind. So a likability group is a planned group where students work together in groups or pairs in which all members have a similar level or similar language ability. I do want to point out, though, that you might not limit this at putting them in ability groups. 
On the next slide, you'll see some different ways that we might group students in similarity groups. You might group them by their interests, by their ages. Maybe you want to group them by their knowledge or ability about a certain topic. Or maybe you want to group them by their dispositions, their personality traits, their learning preferences, their multiple intelligences. There's a lot of different ways to group students into like groups beyond just ability. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So let's move on to the next slide and tell me what likability groupings could you use or do you use in your classroom? Great, so what are ways that you group students according to their similarities, whether it's their similar abilities or other things? Um, so what types of groupings could you use in your classroom or what types of those likability groupings do you use already? By the clothing they wear, nice. So maybe if they have the same style or same color. By their hobbies, that's a great idea. By their interests from Camila. Micah says that they use breakout rooms online um, and groups students in similar ways. Leah Cat says they're age groups. Let's see, God Love says alphabet method is a useful method for me, that's great. And lots of other people who are, oh, by their favorite sports from Patricia, by their same hometown or their same major from Shaq. Great, thanks for sharing everybody. Sounds great. And since someone mentioned breakout rooms, I will add that there are a lot of fun online ways to do this as well with breakout rooms, made maybe with Padlet, maybe with a whiteboard app like Jamboard. You can have student, you can group students into like abilities using any of these different ways, even online. So let's get into talking about it. When do we want to use likability groups? Very often, likability groups work well with controlled practice activities to work in stations. For example, if I want to work with a small group of students and I have other groups doing different things at stations, this is a great way to group people to do that. And also to complete form-focused ta tasks and activities. In the picture you see here, the students are learning parts of the body in English but I have them grouped by different levels. So the beginners have a flashcard and they just have, they're drawing their own pictures, but they're gonna have to post, for example, the word arm on the picture's arm. The higher level groups are having to write out the words and sentences so everyone can work to their own ability. So uh, why? Why do we want to use break, uh, this kind of like ability groups? Well, as I mentioned, we can vary the work for each group. So maybe it's varied by level, but it could be that it's varied by topic if you know they have different interests. It could be varied by the amount of work or reading, grammar points, or the focus. Maybe one group is working more on pronunciation while another group is working more on the content of a reading. So you can do this in a lot of different ways. The key point is with this, we can meet the students where they are. Instead of just hoping everybody gets what we're trying to say, we can work with different groups at different levels. And finally, this can help us with classroom management because we are giving level appropriate work, because we are helping students feel like a team and work together. This can help us in the classroom management department as well. So let's think a little bit about how we get people into likability groups. On the right side of the slide here is kind of my thought process. So first thing I wanna do is decide what factor I'm grouping students by. So if I want them in likability groups, is it because they have the same reading ability, the same personality trait, like I want all the outgoing people in one group and maybe the more shy people in another group? or is it by age or interest or something else? Next, I decide how I will put the students into groups. So we could use matching pieces like we talked about with the random group, but this time I'm using it with intention. So I know who is gonna get which piece. So they end up in the groups I want them to end up in. And you can see on the left, um, my cards again. So passing out cards, you could have them group by the number, by the color, 
by the suit, if it's hearts or diamonds or something, or if you're creating your own flashcards, you can use whatever you like to group students. The bottom picture here is how I've been doing it online because it's a little bit trickier sometimes to intentionally group people online. Sometimes I arrange the material by group by, and group the students with their names. So they all open the same shared document. And once they open that document, they can see which group they're going to be placed in. So I see that I have the cat group, and then I see my list of students who are in that group, the koala group, and the students who are in there. So this is an adaptation for online teaching to get people in intentional groups. So my question for you is, what other techniques have you used to put students into likability pairs or groups? Great, these are such wonderful ideas. I think a lot of teachers are gonna be able to use them very soon in their online or or face-to-face -face classrooms. What other techniques, participants, do you have to put students into likeability pairs or groups? Yes, Patricia agrees with me. Sadia agrees with me. These are all great ideas. Thank you. What other thoughts do you have about this type of group work? So let's see. Um, group work is very vital in teaching and learning. All right, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do have one question, which is, um, how are you, how do you usually monitor group work? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, um, I'm going to guess you're talking about online <laughs> as a place to start. <laughs> In a regular classroom, I monitor group work by walking around, by sitting with each group when I can, and keeping an eye on what everybody's doing. If it's an online group, I try to visit if they're in breakout rooms. I will jump in and out of the breakout rooms to see if they need help. I show them how to call for help in some of the, in Zoom and in other places, there is a way that they can ask for help. So I show them how to do that. And I, if they're working on Padlet or something else, then I keep refreshing my page so that I can see the progress that they are doing and building while they are working in their groups. It's a trickier online for sure. That's great though, thank you for that. Yeah, and a lot of great other responses, like they group people by the sport that they play from Aneta. Um, maybe they group by um, their interests and hobby is what a lot of people are saying. Um, and let's see, Micah says, oh, I missed the comment. <laughs> he, was, he had a nice comment about um, online monitoring that I hope he re repeats because the comments go by so quickly sometimes. My favorite music. Anyways, great. Everybody, um, thank you so much for sharing these great ideas. Thank you very much. So let's move into talking about our last kind of grouping, which is cross ability or mixed ability grouping. And in these kinds of groups, students are working together in groups or pairs in which members have mixed levels or mixed language abilities. And so we call it cross or mixed ability grouping. So, of course, I'm going to ask you, when do you use cross-ability grouping? Are you familiar with it and do you use it at certain times? Yeah, what are some examples of, of times when you would like to use cross-ability grouping or um, what are some examples from your classroom? So when you are implementing group work that includes folks who are from different levels, maybe proficiency levels or that sort of thing or age levels, um, what are some examples of, of sort of situations that you um, are in in your classroom when you would use a cross-ability grouping strategy? Let's see, what do you think? We have some nice comments. Uh, oh, you can choose a leader. That's a great idea for role play. In speaking, Mabel uses cross ability to for um, higher level students to help other students for project work from Patricia. Great. When we're doing different projects that require different abilities from Newit. 
or when students need peer support. That's great, Kareem. Great, thanks for sharing everybody. I'm glad to see you all have a lot of the same ideas I have, and we're going to take a look at some of these. So starting with when do we want to use crossability groups? Crossability groups seem to work really well when we are doing things like role plays or dialogues or maybe some kind of process writing practice. So any communicative activities where there's a lot of different roles people can take in the group crossability groups or pairs can work very well. They can work well for group presentations for that same reason. There are probably several different jobs that need to happen to prepare a presentation so people can work across abilities there. And also for team competitions. So if you're going to have your class divide into teams and compete, then I think that um, not always, but very often, I will intentionally group them into crossability groups. That way I know that the teams are more or less fair and they can compete evenly. And especially if there's grading involved, I like to do it in a fair way. So I may uh, use crossability grouping for that. And before we move off this slide, um, a couple of you pointed out that crossability groups can work really well when you assign roles to students. So, I'll show you that in my picture here, I have a group of four people working together. They are doing a vocabulary scavenger hunt. And in this activity, they have to go through materials and look for certain words and items. So in this group, you can see one person has a pen. She's the scribe of the group. Two people were in charge of materials because there was a lot of materials for this activity. And one person was the timekeeper. So everybody could work at their ability and they could complete the task successfully. So let's move on and look at why we might use crossability groups. One is fairness. If we're having competitions between our student groups, then we might use this in order to keep things fair. Second, there's opportunities no matter how you pair people. So for the people who may have a lower language ability, there is an opportunity for challenge for them to work with people who may have a little bit more progress. On the other side, for the higher level students, I feel like this could be a great moment for peer teaching or mentoring. And as you know, we learn things best by teaching them. So this could be an opportunity for them. And it's also a really nice opportunity to highlight talents and skills that a learner might have. For example, I had a learner once who felt really bad about her low reading ability. She felt like she was not as good as the other students in the class, but she was a really great English speaker. And so I could arrange groups so that sometimes we could highlight the fact that she had a really high level of speaking and that helped her to feel more balanced about where she was with her reading. So those are some reasons why we can use crossability groups. And now really quickly, because we've already covered most of this, let's talk about how we put people into these groups. Well, you can use the same techniques that you've been using to put people into intentional groups. So your flashcards or um, candies or any of those could work just as well for this kind of group. But a note, uh, sometimes teachers feel a little bit overwhelmed or think, Mm, it takes a long time to put people in groups and it maybe gets a little chaotic, so they feel hesitant to do it. One way you can help yourself with that is to use, I will call it two factor matching pieces. So there's two ways you could group people with the same piece. So looking at our cards again, you could group people by the number on the card. So all the twos here, all the aces here. Then you could regroup them and have. For example, all of the hearts here and all of the diamonds here. So with one matching piece, you could have them in mixed ability groups and same ability groups. And it just makes things flow a little bit more smoothly sometimes, both face-to-face -face and online. The second picture there of coins, you could match people up by having the same coin the first time. And maybe the second time they have to make a group that equals I don't know, 35 cents or something. So they have to communicate with each other to make their next group. 
So my question for you is, have you used crossability groups and how have you done it? And you'll see the question on the next slide. Great, yeah, we have some great responses. So what crossability grouping strategies could you use or do you use in your classroom? So Matsudera says, I use crossability grouping and competitive activities among groups. That's great. Liana says she uses them for homework and projects. Maricela says, if students are a little bit shy, she sometimes puts introverts and extroverts together. And let's see, Sophia says, for projects, I usually mix according to their preferences. Some prefer to write or draw, and then I make, and then maybe they are assigned different roles. That's great. And actually, really quickly, we found Micah's great response about monitoring online groups. And he says, I monitor online groups by joining breakout rooms with my camera off, and then he takes notes and gives feedback at the end, which is a, a nice idea. Um, so thanks, everybody. Thanks for sharing those great ideas and responses. Thanks. That is a nice idea. And I think coming soon, we're going to have a few more options in breakout rooms to let students choose their own breakout rooms and change from one room to another. So I think that will open up some new opportunities for us thinking about intentional grouping in an online environment. So I'm looking forward to experimenting with some of these things when they when they are available to us. Okay, so I think it's time to put all this information into action. So I have a couple of case studies for you, classroom scenarios, and I would like to know what you would do in these situations. So let's take a quick look at our first scenario. On the next slide, you're gonna see, I have a class that I want them to do group presentations on US holidays and their age levels are they are 10 to 12 years old and they are mixed ability so they have different proficiency levels let's say between high beginner to low intermediate level my three objectives for them is to learn more about a u.s holiday to create a presentation could be a slides or a poster about that holiday and to give a 20-minute presentation about the holiday working together as a group. So my question for you is, how would you group these students? Would you prefer random grouping, likability, or crossability grouping for them? Great, so we saw this example of uh, an assignment. So we're doing a group presentation in our classrooms. Which of the grouping strategies would you use to have your students complete this task? Would you use random grouping, likability grouping, or crossability grouping? So Mohammed says crossability, great. And of course, we want to know why. So please let us know your rationale for why you would choose a certain method. Looks great. Yoselin also says crossability. So does Carolina, Marisol, Mabel, Zinmar. A lot of people are agreeing that they would like to do cross ability. I would love to see a reason or two from you, our audience. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Abdul Haq says that they would assign each person a different role. Great. Um, and XN says this cross ability would help them to plan better. And Camilla says, because it seems to be many different tasks, and so maybe different levels could be um, good at um, completing different tasks. So great responses, everybody. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing those. And I see some great reasons behind why you would choose um, the, the kind of group you chose. So let me tell you my reasoning and what I chose. The things that I wanted to consider with this activity were, can the tasks to complete the activity be divided in a way that everyone can participate at his or her current level? So I want to make sure that all the different levels of students would have a task that they would be able to do, be challenged, of course, but be able to do and be comfortable doing in the group. And secondly, I was thinking about what will the outcome of the activity look like with intentional grouping? So I imagine if I leave it to random, 
what will the outcome presentations look like? If I put them in mixed ability groups, what will the outcome presentations look like? If I put them in same ability groups, what will it look like at the end? So this was something I wanted to consider, assuming I'm going to give a grade for these activities, then I wanna think about the fairness and the scoring as well. So what I decided was, I decided I would use mixed ability groups or cross ability groups, the same thing that many of you said. And some of the reasons were because I could assign different tasks to the students in the group based on their level and ability. And I saw that some of you also mentioned making sure that there's one good artist in each group so they can make the poster and making someone who likes to talk. So thinking about that as well. And secondly, um, I thought the presentations would vary a lot if I grouped them in likability groups. And I wanted them to be more or less even across the board. So it, for fairness and scoring. So that's what I decided. But of course, your conclusion depends a lot on your context. All right, let's look at our second scenario. In this scenario, I'm teaching online. Like I know many of you are, many of us are teaching online right now. And I would like to create an environment where we do some activity or we do something as a whole group. And then I would like them to be able to talk, do a turn and talk, talk to your shoulder partner kind of thing for a few seconds within, or a few minutes, I should say, between the things that we are talking about. So in this class, my learners are between 18 and 22 years old. They are of low intermediate proficiency level, and I'm teaching 50 minute online classes. So my objectives are for them to practice and critically think about the new material. And secondly, to build speaking skills with a partner. So they're not only learning the content, but they're also having a chance to communicate and to build speaking skills with a partner. So my question for you is how would you want the students divided? Is it better random, likability, or crossability? And a second question, do you want them to work with the same partner each time? All right, great question. And we have another interesting scenario that's probably very similar to one that we all are facing right now. Um, so we have our students in an online setting and we want them to be able to practice speaking skills and to critically think about new material. How would you group students in this case? Um, and would you keep them with the same partner? So Camilla says that she would group them randomly so that they can meet different partners all the time. That's a great idea. Thank you for sharing. Let's see, Precious says they would choose all different types of grouping in this case. Juana says random grouping will work nicely so that they can support each other. Carolina says likability groups since they have to deal with new material and they have to talk. So maybe they feel less intimidated if they're working with someone who has the same level as they do. Sarwat says that they would use random grouping and different partners. And Rita says the same. She would use random and then give the students the chance to switch partners. All right, thank you for sharing everybody. Thank you so much. I love the wide variety of answers, but each one has a very good reason for doing that kind of grouping. So let me share with you what I decided in my group. I wanted to consider classroom management during breakout room time. Someone mentioned that earlier today. How do we manage the smaller groups? So I wanted to think about that. And I wanted to consider the amount of time that it takes to rearrange groups. Once I've put people in groups once, how much time does it take to reorganize them? And third, I wanted to think about student rapport. I wanted to think about how would it be different if they had a new partner each time versus worked with the same partner for that 50 minute class period. So I decided, I decided to use random groups and have them work with the same partner each time for that class period. Um, the reasons were because it takes more time to rearrange the groups. 
And I wanted to not take that time. I wanted to keep people as focused as possible throughout the lesson. Second, uh, I wanted the students to get to know one person a little bit instead of changing each time, um, especially if we're teaching really large classes or if our students actually have not met face to face, because that is the case for many of us now, they might not really know each other like they would in a smaller face to face classroom. So letting them get to know one person by meeting them multiple times in that session, I thought would be an interesting way for them to build rapport. And third, I thought about um, joining groups that I think would need more help or management from me so that I could jump into the group, the Facebook, the Facebook, I'm sorry, the breakout group, and I could help them as needed or make sure that they were on task. So that's, that's what I decided. Yeah, and I have a quick question. If other people chose a different um, grouping, does that mean they were incorrect? Not at all. We all have a different context in teaching, and I think it's very different if, for example, you have a small class versus a big class. I think it's different if you have, if your students know each other or not, and just the activity that you want them to do. Just because I chose that they meet the same person over and over for 15 minutes for this class doesn't mean that the next class I won't try it in a different way and see what the outcome is. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you for looking at these scenarios with us and giving us your great ideas and and your great um, rationalizations about why you would be doing each of these things. I love it. So finally, and really quickly, I know sometimes it still seems complicated to group students intentionally and especially online. So I wanted to very quickly share with you one way that you can help to see your students kind of on a grid format so it might help you to organize their groups. Um, on the next slide, we can see a quick grid idea. This is something I just made in a notebook and I have my students' names on little sticky notes. And you can see I have speaking here. So I'm thinking about their speaking ability level. And I'm just taking a sticky note with their names. And I started in the left corner with who I think has the highest speaking ability. And I'm just putting their names into the grid across. So the top left corner has the highest speaking ability and the bottom right corner has lower speaking ability. Now I can very easily put people into like ability groups by just looking across the, the chart. And so the people in one row have more or less like ability in speaking. And if I want people in cross ability groups, I look at the column. And so I have more or less a cross ability, cross section of speaking abilities in that group. And because the students are on sticky notes, if there's some kind of classroom management issue that I can anticipate ahead of time, I can easily just switch. Okay, I know Rueda and Claudia don't work well together, so I will switch a couple of people so that they are not working together in a group all of the time. Also, you don't have to stick to the same topic. So this one was about speaking, but my next one might be about interest in sports because that's our next topic. So I could have the most interested people to the least interested people, but the outcome is the same, likability and crossability grouping. And um, I got this from a book I read about multi-level classes. And of course, you can find the information in our last slide with the references if you want to know more about that. So my final challenge for you is to think about how you group students in your classes. Are there times when you can group them more intentionally? And what new ideas will you try this week from this hour? I hope you got a few new ideas. I know I did from you all, and I appreciate being able to talk with you today. Awesome, thank you so much. We see a lot of people saying, great idea, love this idea, very interesting, things like that. Wonderful arrangement for grouping from Kareem. Um, so thank you so much for those wonderful comments, everybody. And I know I got a lot of great ideas and tips out of today's webinar, and I'm sure that all of you did as well. And we hope that you will let us know how you're using these types of um, grouping strategies in your classrooms, whether they're online or face-to-face. -face. 
All right. So thank you again, Kim, for a wonderful session. Um, we're so happy to have you here today. And I think, as I said, we all have a great understanding of how to implement these strategies based on your excellent presentation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs>